Good afternoon from Barcelona. Uh, good morning if you're in New York. I think it's 10 o'clock in the morning because we've changed the time over here in Spain. And good evening if you're in Shanghai. I think the time change is going to be good for our people in Asia because I think it's one hour earlier. And I think it was kind of crazy to be doing webinars uh, so late at night, but we're trying to find the right time to talk to everybody in the world. Um, my name is Mike Rosenberg. I'm a strategy professor at IESA Business School, and it's a pleasure to, to be back on another one of our series of webinars to help people deal with the coronavirus, uh, which now called COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 or whatever you wanna call it, this, this terrible um, virus, which is sweeping around the world and causing disruption, havoc, um, illness, and of course, uh, loss of life. Uh, at ESA Business School, we're trying to, to do what we can to help, uh, which is why we're broadcasting uh, these uh, webinars to our alumni association, in fact, to anyone else who wants to listen. Uh, the webinars are available on, on LinkedIn Live, and you can also see them afterwards on the ESA website, as well as, uh, as some other places. Uh, if you've been following the series, we're talking about different uh, academic issues or different uh, functional aspects of the business as it is affected by this um, emergency. Um, some weeks ago, we had a professor from supply chain. This was a uh, Wengming Zhu, who explained a little to about he explained to us a little bit about Chinese New Year and the disruptions which were happening in in Wuhan, China. Now, three weeks later, those disruptions are happening all over the world. Uh, with us today, I have my my friend and colleague Jauma Rivera. Jauma, welcome to to the series. Thank you very much, Mike. Glad to be here. Yeah, Jauma is a professor of, of uh, operations in our operations management department. Uh, over the last uh, 40 years, when he's been a professor at ESA Business School, or almost 40 years, he's been uh, not only the director of his department, he's been the dean of faculty at ESA Business School. He's also been, for the last 33 years, a, a visiting professor at CEIBS, a business school in, in China, with its headquarters in Shanghai, uh, that uh, we do a lot of work together with. Uh, from ESA Business School. He's the author of, of books about the hospital of the future, and he's also published a series of books on the automotive industry in China, because besides being an expert on operations and automotive, uh, Professor Rivera is also an expert on healthcare. Now, Jama, because of your background, I mean, perhaps you, you're, you're in a very privileged position to talk a little bit about this crisis and maybe put it into some kind of historical perspective with other crises is that people talk about the uh, what we call the Spanish flu in the rest of the world. I don't think you call that here in Spain, but how, how does this crisis compare to other crises? Well, that's a, a good question. In fact, uh, I don't think there is much we can compare this crisis to other crises. Uh, we have to we have a tendency to collective forgetfulness and it takes periods like this one to go and, and dig in history to find yeah, if there is some, anything in the past that we can refer to and we can learn from. Uh, there was an interesting article in The Economist about a year ago uh, for um, relating to a study done by some professors who studied the last 900 years of the floating episodes in the Central Europe, in the Vertava Basin, um, the river that goes through Prague. And they discovered that uh, it takes around one generation for the people to forget what happens. After one generation, after 25, 30 years, people start building on the riverbed sides again uh, because they have forgot the previous flow. Something similar happens in other areas. So it's good that in periods like this one, we try to remember what has happened in the past. And in terms of the coverage, probably the, the Spanish flu, as it was known, not because it started in Spain, but because Spain at the time was one of the few countries that had free press and was able to publish these things, the rest of the world was in the middle of the war and they didn't want to uh, demotivate the people in their respective countries. So it ended up being known as the, the Spanish flu. Uh, in terms of coverage, it was quite big, uh, but not as much as this one, I imagine it will end up being. Sometimes we refer to a last crisis that we have memory of, which was the financial crisis of uh, 2008. Uh, but even in this one, uh, they suffer a lot. Some countries suffer more than others. But in, in most countries, the employment, for example, in Spain, it went up to 20, 25%. In the US, it went to uh, 10%, 11%. 11%. Even in the, in the Great Depression in the US, it was up to 25%. But now we can find in countries uh, with this uh, current crisis, 
you can very easily get to an employment of 50%. And I'm not forecasting this, I'm just saying that it could happen. We need to work on that. We need to flatten the uh, infection rate is what the people in public health are trying to do. But we also need to flatten the recession curve because unless governments act together to work on that, we're going to suffer more uh, in the economic side than we may suffer on the health side. So, um, so this crisis you think is gonna be worse perhaps than, than some of the others? Uh, I mean, if we think about the different crises uh, that we might see. It may be worse in terms of the of the coverage. There is a difference with the previous crisis is that uh, the level of medicine is much more advanced now and we have the capacity to react much quicker because of the communications, because of the, the capacity that we have in different countries. But remember, not all the countries have the same capacity. What the Chinese okay. have been able to do, uh, it may not be possible in some countries in Africa. Okay, now I see that there's something like 800 or 900 people already uh, watching the, the live broadcast on LinkedIn. I would encourage all of you to use the comment space on the LinkedIn website because that'll allow us to see your questions. I can see your questions directly. And then also we have uh, Sabrina Voss from our Alumni Association. She's gonna be typing in questions, uh, which I can show, uh, I can actually see on my iPad here. So as we go through the session, uh, please feel free to, to say what you think, what's on your mind. Um, and, 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 and use the comment space on the platform uh, to do that. Let me just make sure I turn mine on so I can see all your comments. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so Jama, it, you know, given a crisis, and, and I think I, I have shown uh, in this series kind of uh, Patrick Lagadec's uh, five steps of crisis management, but I think from an operations management point of view, you also have uh, five steps or five different things to think about. Could you share with us the, that, that model of, of, of those five things that, that basically companies or organizations should be doing as they come into crisis? Sure, the, we always follow the similar five steps that in other, in other industries and in other, uh, you know, so we look about the prevention, detection, survival or uh, fighting the crisis, recovery and, uh, and finally go back to a normal and compete again. Maybe for some of these stages, it's maybe a little, a little bit too late now, but uh, since most likely we have not done our homework in the first stages, it is time to do them as soon as possible. We can still use some of these tools and also we can uh, benefit uh, from the stages that we still have time to perform well. So in particular, we can look at the, the first stage, which is the prevention stage. In the prevention stage, what we try to do is to prevent uh, both the occurrence of things to happen and also the uh, impact that this uh, crisis could have. In order to do that, the first step that uh, we suggest in here is the step of get to know your supply chain. Okay? In order to be able to manage something, we need to have visibility. And that involves uh, mapping the existing supply chain, map where you are, what are your customers, what are your suppliers, what are the customers' customers, the suppliers' suppliers, and so on, to have a, a visibility over the whole chain. Figure out where the facilities of these providers are, not where the headquarters are, but where are the facilities where they make the products. There may be an American company making the products in Wuhan. Well, you are in trouble now, okay? even if the company is in America. Uh, similar, we want to figure out what is the capacity of their plants and how much of this capacity is being utilized now. Figure out where the inventories are in this situation. And finally, a map where the things are in transit. The second stage is try to capture the real demand. Uh, I think uh, my colleague uh, Wei Ming Zhu mentioned about the, the Woolwith effect. Woolwith effect is created by uh, unreal demands that occur because of lack of communication and delays in the supply chain. We need to understand what are the real demands. Uh, even if people buy a lot of toilet paper, that does not mean we are going to use this toilet paper in the short term. So the real demand is very similar, the same than it was before. Try to figure out where the, dislike, the disruptions are likely to occur in the chain. There are some parts where we have higher probabilities of having disruption than other parts. Try to identify where these are. Look for available alternatives. Uh, available alternatives may mean uh, different suppliers, may mean uh, different products that may fit your existed, uh, your final product. 
may mean getting uh, support or cooperation with some of your competitors, including. And finally, it's a good time also to do some supply chain stress test. Okay, we do that in other industries. Uh, it is uh, also possible to do it in all the processes that we have in the company and the supply chain is precisely a very important process. So we need to run this one as well. And Jama, I guess everybody's getting a, a big test right now in their supply chain. Um, but how do you find out, you know, where your stuff is actually made? I mean, is this information available to anybody? And and when we're thinking about the first year suppliers, maybe it's it's not so difficult, but if you think about your second or your third or, you know, all the way back to raw materials, how do we even approach that problem? Well, this is a, not an easy task, as you mentioned. And when we talk about uh, some very well-known recalls by important companies, for example, Mattel recalling some of their toys, well, uh, the problem is that they, even large companies like them, they have a limited view of their whole supply chain. And it takes a, a, a bad uh, impact to figure out and to be able to understand what is the real supply chain and what is the second tier and the third tier suppliers. This is something that it is not printed. Uh, supply chains tend to be much more opaque than we believe. Uh, we are used to go into Amazon and figure out where our package is and to be able to track <laughs> the package all the way from the warehouse to our home. Well, this is not the, the reality in most of the supply chain. We, it's very difficult for most companies to figure out where their products are beyond their first tier suppliers. That's true, it's difficult, but that's why it's important to do it. And of course, it's easier to do it when the times are good than when we are in a crisis. So in theory, people should have already done these kinds of, of analysis and prevention, but assuming that they haven't or haven't done it as well as they could, uh, would you encourage people to put a team of scientists or data people, you know, right now, even real time to, to drill into this stuff? It is, if they have the time to do it, and I'm, uh, I'm afraid that most of us will have some free time in the coming month is a good uh, way to do it, good way to use this time. Okay, so what's the next step? After, after assuming that you've got a good understanding of where you are and you know where your challenges are, what's, what's, what comes after that? The next step is the detection. In detection, we want to figure out when something occurs. We want to be able to monitor the supply chain. And as you mentioned, it's very difficult to monitor something that you don't know it exists. So that's why mapping the supply chain was the first step. Then we can start detecting when something is happening in here. We need to separate the signals from the noise. And depending on the reaction that we have, when we detect something unusual, something unusual may be a delay, maybe a message from one of our suppliers saying, it will take us two more days to deliver what you order. So this supplier has never had any delay. This may raise some suspicions. This is exactly what happened in a case that we teach in some of our programs of two very well-known companies, uh, Nokia and Ericsson, when they were at the peak of their uh, mobile phones uh, manufacturing. All, both of them were supplied by Philips making a very critical component. At one time, Philips uh, mentioned to both of them that there has been a small fire in one of their plants in uh, New Mexico, and that it, that will delay at most by a week the supplies that they uh, were promised. Both companies received the same email. Uh, Ericsson decided, well, it's just a minor impact. Nokia decided to, la to send a team of engineers to Philips to help Philips recover and to really understand what was going on there. That allowed Nokia uh, more than a week time uh, to realize that the problem was not as small as originally thought and that they could uh, start reacting to the problem. At the time, Ericsson discovered that the problem was big. Most of the existing capacity has already been used by Nokia. So figure out, detect the noise, separate the noise from the signal, and act on the signals. We may want to use some, uh, what I call the Donald Ransell framework, when he mentioned that uh, there are no knowns, there are things we know we know. We also know there are some unknown unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things that we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know, we don't know. Well, it's a good time also to figure out where do we have the sensors to know that we know things, some things that we know we don't know, but we can start working to know them, and some things that we don't know that we don't know, and these are the worst. 
because if we don't know that we don't know, there is nothing we can do to get to learn them. So and you make out, a reference drama to Donald Rumsfeld. He was the former uh, um, uh, minister of war or minister of defense of the United States. And he made a speech once about the Iraq war when he, he managed to reel off all of these things in, in one big thing saying, we don't really know what's going to happen. And I think this, this crisis is a great example of, of, you know, unknown unknowns. There is a lot we don't know about what's going to happen next. Well, I agree. This is uh, this was an unknown unknown for most of us uh, a month and a half ago. But, well, I remember but, my my sister. I was actually supposed to be teaching in China, and my 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 older sister said, "Hey, you know, it, this is this is two months ago." She said, "Is it a good time to go to China because of the of the outbreak?" I said, "You know," and I was like, "What outbreak?" And this was only you know two and a half months ago. So it's amazing how fast this yeah. thing has 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 taken taken a control of our of our world, of our economy, and, and even our lives. That's exactly why I think it's important to, for us to start detecting things as soon as possible. For example, uh, if we look at the, why it took so long in this case for us to, to find it, it's uh, most of us don't pay attention to the signals. We take for granted that these unknown unknowns are not going to affect us. But of course, as you mentioned, two months ago, one and a half months ago, this was no longer an unknown unknown. This was already a known unknown. And many of us could have done something to get to know more about this, but probably we didn't, okay? Uh, okay, after, so, so prevention, detection, what comes after that? After that, we get the survival, which is where we are now. How can we survive this? <laughs> now, the first thing we need to do is try to do all the things that you have not done previously and try to do whatever is possible at this moment. Of course, we want to also identify the emerging risk, the, the action plans that we can take now, what are the coming risks and things that may start occurring. You know, the borders are closing, some uh, suppliers are uh, blocking the workers away. Uh, we have, we are going to have material shortages, we're going to have people shortages, we're going to have increases in price. All of these are the things that we may want to identify now. Then make a, a choice of what can we use our uh, scarce resources for. And by scarce resources, I mean our people, our workers. Maybe it's time to reallocate some of the workers from one area to another to make the best use of the capacity. The supplies that we still have, which products should these supplies go into? And also, how do we allocate these finished products into our customers? Are we going to use margin only as a decision? or we're going to take into account the criticality that these products may have for our customers and their customers in the long term. So figure out what is the best use of whatever we have in terms of the resources. And finally, a good point here is to look at the governments. There is a tendency to uh, concentrate, it's a tendency to centralize decisions at this point, which may be good. It's good to centralize the information, to be able to diffuse the information, to make the, inf the information transparent to everybody in the chain. But it is not good to centralize decision making into some people who have not made these decisions in the past. The fact that all of a sudden I am nominated the uh, coronavirus champion in my company doesn't make me smarter than I was yesterday. And probably there are many more people in the company that I know a lot more than me on that. And I should count on them to make these decisions. So centralization of information, but still, decentralization and use the available information to make the best decision in the company. Yeah, our, our colleague Sandra Sieber mentioned uh, that quite a lot and she has a webinar uh, where she talks about moving us online, which was very interesting. And one of the things that the school did is, is first set up a, a response team to figure out how to do that. And she was uh, on that team. But then as soon as the situation was in place to disband that team and bring control back to the line organization. And I think one of the findings that, that, that she saw is, and, and, and this I think is consistent with crisis management literature in general, is sometimes the people you need to make crazy connections, to think about new ways to do things, to, to innovate, are not the normal people who are running the business. And, and as soon as you've got the solution in place, then maybe it's time to actually give the, give the business back to the folks who are supposed to run the business, perhaps with the new ideas. So, so, so after survival, we come to recovery because we will recover someday, right? Yes, I hope so. And I hope it, it um, doesn't take, China's uh, coming back. I think you have lots of friends in, in China and I think you have better data than I. What, what is the situation right now in Wuhan and the rest of China? 
Wuhan companies are starting back to work. Most of them, they are starting by stages. You cannot start and move to 100% immediately. You need to start by stages. Other parts of China, they are starting a school again in, uh, in one week or 10 days. Uh, people in other parts of the country have not been as affected as we have in countries like the, the, the Spain or Italy or France on that. So it, it will be easier for the people in China to recover than maybe for many of our uh, countries here. So what else, so what is what what do we have to think about in this recovery phase? Well, in the recovery phase, we are going to be in what I call here the new normal. The first time I, I heard it as expression was precisely in China when Xi Jinping created uh, actually coined the term, saying that we are going to be in a normal situation that's different from what we understood by normal until now, which means that he was going to create the new normal and the country will have to play in these new normal conditions. Okay, now we are will end up in a new normal situation. For example, for us, I think, in the, in the, in the ESI, uh, teaching online will be more normal in the future than it has been in the past, okay? We have, we have tried, we have learned that, and there are probably many things more than we can do online that we used to do. And it takes a crisis to discover, to innovate in these areas. But uh, also, the, uh, the, the next thing in here, uh, in the new normal, don't forget, uh, going back to Ramsfall framework, that there is one thing in this uh, framework that we have not shown until now. And it is that part of what we know may no longer be true in the new normal. So uh, it would be a mistake to continue operating as we operated in the past. There are many different things that will occur in the future that we may not recover exactly as they were in the beginning of January of this year. So we need to figure out what is still true of the things that we knew and what's had changed. And John, sure. I, there's a lot of questions. Um, I know we're gonna do questions later, but there's a lot of questions about whether this whole crisis will be the end of globalization, if companies will start sourcing uh, more locally in the future, if um, you know, if, if this over-reliance on China is now a thing of the past, you can you can either address that now or, or wait a few moments if you will, but I, I think it is that we have at least 10 different questions more or less in the same direction. Okay, let me answer this now because it relates also to the part of what I'm going to talk soon. Okay, I think the, it's, it's amazing because um, in, it's a, in, the, in the US, for example, the, the candidates, there are candidates on the two parties that are actually uh, fighting for, let's uh, go back to where we were, let's uh, re reduce globalization. We can see the same thing in some parties in, the, in our European countries as well. There is more reshoring, more insourcing of everything that we did in the past. We have been depending on China for a long term. However, I think similar to what Mark Twain used to say, I think that the rumors of the death of globalization have been, have been greatly exaggerated, okay? I don't think that we are going to eliminate the globalization. In part because in our countries, we have dismantled many industries and it will take a long time to build them again. Okay, some years ago, Apple this, uh, found out that it could not manufacture a complete computer in the US because some things as a screws, there was nobody in the US that could make them in the same way that the Chinese could. Chinese are very good at manufacturing and they are very good because they have created clusters around the country. And you have the cluster for shoes in one part of the country, you have the cluster for toothbrushes in another part of the country, you have the cluster for uh, aeronautics in another part of the country. And of course, this is not just get a few workers together, put them in a factory and let us start. You need to have the, the, the knowledge, you need to have the workers, you have the facilities, you need to have the suppliers, you need to have the talent, you need to have the universities teaching that. And that's not something that you can create overnight. So my vision is that globalization is not dead. If we move to China, it was not because our presidents and our prime minister fell in love with China. It was because there were sound economic reasons to do so. And dismantling that, even though the salary in, has been increased in China and some other countries in Asia, and it could justify moving some things back, it will be difficult to move everything back. So maybe slowly we may move this back, but I'm sure that most of it, it will remain as it is, because there are quite a lot of advantages in doing the work, the things in the way we plan now. So I don't know if okay. I completely answered that. Fantastic, question. fantastic. So what else What else do people need to think about in terms of recovery? Well, in terms of recovery, we need to uh, 
go back for plans to recovery. What do we want to do when uh, these things start being over? What are the stages? Are you going to start all of a sudden? Can we turn the switch on and everything will be like before? No, we'll need to do it step by step. So what are the stages that we need to do it here? We may want to revisit the previous stages. Prevention, detection, uh, are the things the same as they were before? Is the supply map the same? Do we really want our supply chain map to be the same as before? Or is it time to change it? Is it time to attract new suppliers? Maybe it is not easy because uh, after a crisis, it's not a good time to find new friends. Probably you need to find them before the crisis. That's when you can do the due diligence, you can do all this work, but maybe we need to do it now. We may want to question, as you mentioned in the previous uh, question by the participants, make or buy some things we decided to buy from China. Is it time to question if we just want to make them again or not? And in here we need to go back to the basics. How core is this product and how is the availability of this product in the open market? If it's non-core and widely available, obviously outsource. If it's core and not available, of course, we already have it in home. The problem is in the other two quadrants, things that are core and widely available or non-core and non-widely available. Maybe there are some opportunities for us to also to uh, explore in these areas. And Jamo, finally, there's a couple of, on that, there's a couple of questions about, yeah. about um, uh, pharma, uh, raw materials for pharma, pharmaceuticals and about uh, healthcare supplies, et cetera, for the United States. And there's a specific question, you know, will the United States run out of stuff because most of that is now made in China. Yeah. There are a lot of pharmaceuticals, not pharma equipment in part, but also chemicals that go into uh, pharmaceuticals that are made in China. In fact, some companies, I know uh, Sanofi in France, uh, promised to build their own supply chain so that they don't depend on anybody else. Okay, well, the problem here is that if you decide to build everything in France, what happens in the next coronavirus or whatever you want to, may call it, that happens to be in France. And France happens to be closed and all the other countries are still open. And so it is not a question of closing all the borders or it's more a question of creating redundancies and, and having the supply chains that we have now at the same time have uh, alternative supply chains that we may want to use and we have the possibility to uh, uh, increase their capacity when the need occurs. I understand that Schneider Electric has a has a global policy to have two sources for everything they buy from different parts of the world. Maybe they're buying 80% from the company in somewhere in China, but 20% from a company in France or Germany, just as as a policy all the time. In just just for that reason, would you would you recommend that kind of thinking? Absolutely. It's not only uh, Standard Electric; it's also there are some liquor companies in the world that have decided to duplicate or triplicate their production in different continents so that there is at least one part of the world who may be able, unless otherwise, unless of course that the whole world is in trouble. And even in this case, look at the coronavirus, we may end up the whole world being in trouble, but it has been a staggered trouble. It started in China, uh, one week later it appeared in Korea, uh, 10 days later, 10 days after China, it was Japan, one month later it's Europe, so now China is back into almost normal operations and we are having trouble in the US and Europe. So if you stagger, if you separate, if you fraction your production in different parts of the world, you are more uh, uh, robust than you could be otherwise. That's so, so, so after recovery, what do we have to do next? After recovery, what you want to do is to uh, prepare the company to compete again, okay? We'll have to compete again. Uh, I know everybody saying that the crisis is an opportunity, but a crisis like the one we uh, put here is an opportunity uh, to innovate. There are many cases in which we discuss whether uh, it is worth to do some innovation or not, because uh, it is the trade-off between uh, the, the advantages that we can get and the problems uh, that we, and the, and the, and the problems, it's difficult to find the proper balance. Well, in a crisis like this one, uh, the problem is do, doing nothing is not an option. So we need to do something. So in this case, doing something, whether it works or it not, we are going to learn. So that creates new opportunities for innovation that were probably not possible before. And there are many companies that might have wanted to change things in the past, but it was impossible for them. And now it's possible. 
I remember many years ago when just in time started being popular in Europe, that a company in Spain, a manufacturing company, went to the suppliers and said, from now on, I want you to do, I want you to do this, this, and this because of just in time. Well, what he asked the suppliers to do had nothing to do with just in time. It's something that he want, this company wanted to do in the past. But now with the excuse of just in time, they said maybe now they are going to uh, follow my advice. So use the opportunity. The next one is to prepare for future events, learn from what has happened, and make sure to embed these learnings into the processes or into the uh, checklist, because memories are too short. We forget very quickly. We get the reshoring sourcing that we discussed before. That's something we'll need to question again. We we'll want to have that. We we'll want to move to several suppliers, at least two in different parts of the world. And how are we going to compete in the new normal? And this goes back to the uh, competitive operational strategy, but that would take us uh, a complete different session just to get into that. So that's Thanks, all Jamos. from my side. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jama, for those five steps. So if we think about, about you know, the current crisis, then there's a bunch of questions about it. When do you think Europe will open again? Uh, China was down for about two and a half, I guess, three months, and now it seems to be ramping up. Uh, we are in our, sec our third week of lockdown here in Spain. Um, do you have a crystal ball? Do you have a thought about, you know, again, combining your, your knowledge about supply chain with your knowledge about um, healthcare systems? Uh, I hope I had the crystal ball. Uh, unfortunately not, but uh, you can see there is a, you, you can see the flow of the supply chain, as I mentioned. Everything started in, in, in China and the Koreans had not seen any problem until a week later, which was some of the uh, Chinese- Well, they reacted very to... well. I mean, there's a whole case study about how how they... quickly the Korean authorities isolated the, the virus and were able to, to get those people attention and, and, and limit their contact with other people. Almost they a did. textbook they case of what, of what you have to do. Well, in fact, there is something uh, similar to the bullwhip effect that may have happened here. Okay, the closer you are to the, the eruption, the easier it is for you to react. That's why everything started in China. China had been very easy. It was somewhat easy for them to react. I'm not saying it's easy, but it was easy because they were the first source. Korea and Japan came afterwards. Korea and Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, that was the second wave, I'd say. So that would be like in the bullwhip effect, you go from retainer to wholesaler. Uh, the US and Europe are in the third stage on that. The, I think the, the, the eruption here will be bigger and will take longer for us uh, to recover from that. So I know exactly how long it will take because it will also depend a lot about the effectiveness of the measurements. The Chinese are very obedient people. Uh, when the, the Chinese said, the Chinese government said, everybody's confined, they were confined. And actually I had some of my Chinese friends texting me, what are the Spanish and Italians doing? You think that nothing is happening here. Are you really serious enough about this? Well, when Italy and Spain, we decided that we were having a problem here. The first thing that the Spanish thought was, let's go to our vacation place because it will be fun. We'll be having more fun there. And of course, that was a, a bad move. So I don't know how long it will take in these countries, how long it may take in the US. It all depends on the, on the actions taken by the government and also on the obedience by the uh, population. But what we need to do, given that we have more time, is to make sure that when we get over this crisis, we are ready for the recovery and this uh, new competition. So we have time to prepare for that. Let's do it. Now, there are a couple of questions here about, about whatever that time period is, uh, and specifically with respect to the supply chains here in Europe on food. Because um, uh, uh, last time uh, I went out, uh, and I think my wife was out shopping a couple of days ago, the supermarkets are still full. There's plenty of everything. You know, how long can we can we keep this up, or or is there a is there a kind of a shadow crisis in the food companies and the distribution companies, which might you know upset this whole thing? Well, I don't think that most of the uh, food companies they have been able to work throughout the crisis, so they have not been shut down like other industries. So I don't expect uh, that this is going to have an impact on, on the basic food products. It may have an impact on some uh, delicacies that come from uh, faraway countries, faraway countries. 
but I think the basic supply should be uh, guaranteed, provided that we maintain uh, their capacity to continue manufacturing. I think the agricultural uh, people, they are still on the fields. They need to collect, they need to harvest the products that are coming right now. They cannot delay that. If you delay that, then we will be in trouble. So we need to have the agriculture and the transportation to be uh, considered as basic uh, companies uh, that keep working even during the crisis. If we are able to continue with that, I don't foresee problems in the food chain. And Jelma, you mentioned the bullwhip effect uh, in talking about the spread of the virus, but in terms of, of production, you know, I think a few weeks ago in some parts of the world, there's no toilet paper because everybody bought too much toilet paper. Does that then trigger a problem for the toilet paper factories uh, down the line? How, how does this whole bullwhip thing work? Well, this is an, an interesting exercise we do with our students in many of our programs. What happens is, uh, imagine you are a retailer and all of a sudden you see an increase in the sale of toilet paper by 10%. It's been much more, but let's imagine 10% for the sake of the, of the example now. Okay, now what the next thing you think is, well, uh, I will order more toilet paper to compensate for this increase, but it's gonna take a while before I receive this order. So during this period, my toilet paper is, the inventory is going to go down because my demand has been increased. So I better order not only for the toilet paper in, uh, demand increase, but also for the depletion of inventories that I'm going to have. And further, I want to have higher inventories because there will be a higher demand. So if my final demand is 10%, I may pass an order 20% higher to my wholesaler. The wholesaler look at the same thing and pass an order 40% higher to the distributor. And eventually that reaches the factory and the factory cannot keep up with the production. So if you have not been exposed to this problem, this is what happens. But everybody knows, everybody who's taken a course in supply chain, and supply chain managers have done that, they know that they cannot follow the demand uh, as it is. They should be able to separate the real demand from the noise. And if somebody- well, they, they, has, they, they should know, but the one question is what they know and what question is what they're actually doing. Well, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> clearly, uh, most of the population who have not had this uh, supply chain, they are the stockpiling on toilet paper. I'm sure that they are not using it so far. So what that means is that for a while, uh, people will stop buying toilet paper. I have not seen toilet paper as a, uh, a resource that people want to keep on like gold or- uh, Right, now if we look, uh, there's a bunch of questions kind of looking forward. And at first there's a couple on the medium term and a couple on the long term. On the medium term, uh, one, one uh, Andoni uh, Larothea is asking about China's second Corona wave. And the idea that there will be a second Corona wave, and and will that impact more issues on the supply chain, and maybe maybe affect other places? Well, there is probably going to be more than one wave, uh, similar to the earthquakes. But in this case, I think uh, if it happens in China, China has already the potential to detect and react very quickly to whatever is happening now. So they have, uh, they know what to do. They have done it, so they know what needs to be done next as soon as uh, a new focus starts. The same thing will probably happen in some of our countries. I'm not completely sure of that, but I know. We know what needs to be done. We have learned it, so we'll need to apply. And again, similar to what I explained here in this presentation, for coronavirus, we need to have prevention. So China has already forbid the sale of wild animals in uh, markets. So that's one of the things that's supposed to be at the, at the origin of this crisis. This has been completely forbidden already, so this part will not. There may be other crises coming, maybe not coronavirus as we know it, there may be another one, but every new crisis allows us to put in place the prevention, the detection, and the survival mechanism in place. And many of these will be able to apply to the future crisis, be that the second wave of coronavirus or be that a new crisis. Now, you, you mentioned just-in-time delivery, um... And, and, and for the last 30 years, I think, the operations department at the SA Business School has been helping people you know, get leaner, uh, implement lean manufacturing, take out safety stock all over the place. Uh, is this the end of just-in-time? Will companies go back to having you know, reasonable quantities of state safety stock uh, in the system, uh, paying for that, obviously, and, and, and kind of having a different view of, of what is important, whether it's to be the leanest you can be or actually to be the most resilient you can be? 
you need to combine both of them. There is a, a tendency when a crisis occurs to look for a, a single, simple culprit to blame for. Okay, and now I've seen also a lot of articles blaming just in time for that and say, if we had not had just in time, well, if we had not had just in time, we'd be much worse now than we are. There'll be many products that we will not be able to have because they will be much more expensive and, and, and so on. So we will not be as efficient as we are. Of course, there are different views of lean. One of them is that the lean is, or just in time, is elimination of waste. So you need to eliminate waste. And inventories is just one of the different ways that companies have, okay? Inventories are a solution to problems. So inventories, in the, when they solve the problem, for example, you want to have large inventories for a seasonal product like ice cream or the air conditioners. You start manufacturing them in the winter and you keep inventories for the summer because you don't have the production capacity to do everything in the summer. Okay? So this inventory is not, it's not a waste, it's useful. You decide what is the use for that inventory. You also want to have large inventories if you want to reduce the cost of setting up machines. If you are able to reduce the cost of setting up the machine, you can set up the machines and, and manufacture in smaller batches. So before you eliminate inventories, you need to eliminate what is the cost that justifies having this inventory. If you do that, inventories are good for the normal circumstances, for the normal disruptions, for the uncertainty that we face. Now, assume that we are going to have enough inventories for an event like coronavirus is crazy. Coronavirus is not normal operations. We cannot compensate coronavirus with safety, inv safety inventories when we keep in our warehouse. We may want to have safety capacity like we have in the airports with the firemen that spend a whole year doing nothing. They are just there. That's available capacity that is not being used. We have our military forces that also most of the years, they don't do anything, okay? This is the excess capacity that we have for the known unknowns that we know that could happen. Uh, Jamal, have... on that, on that topic, Pedro is asking is, is if the, if the uh, culprit is uh, boards of directors and the financial community, which has encouraged us to be, you know, everything for the, the highest uh, profits, the highest return on net assets, at the cost of having some of that excess slack in the system, which, which you would need for resilience? Well, uh, I don't know if it's the board of directors. I'm sure that um, the, the life of the day-to-day -day life of most of the managers is busy in their day-to-day -day life. And there should be someone on the board who takes care of looking at the future and, and foreseeing some problems like the ones we're facing. But there is also probably someone in the same way that in the banks, we have the risk manager we should have some supply chain risk manager in companies. And these guys should raise a flag when things become too dangerously short of inventories. So I don't know if it's the board of directors. Uh, it is ourselves as uh, consumers, okay? We can blame the board of directors, but when we go to supermarket and we find one product which is uh, 20 cents cheaper than another product because they don't have to pay for a higher inventory, we buy the cheapest one. Okay, so it is also yeah. us if, so I, I, would, I would just answer, Pedro, that in, in my view, the it's got to be the board who asks the supply chain people to protect them against certain risks. The supply chain person saying, hey, boss, there's a risk and we need to spend a lot of money normally doesn't get very far. But that's that's Mike's personal opinion. Jama, there's a, a because of your background and because of your expertise in, in, in healthcare, there's a bunch of questions about your opinion about how Spain and Europe and even the world have been managing the crisis and and do you think they're doing a good job and and what do you think people what do you think governments should be doing to kind of balance these uh, there's the health crisis and of course the economic crisis um, and these are somewhat linked that the more we do to flatten the viral infection rate the deeper the pain on the economy there's a very specific question about you know with so much unemployment in Spain you know will we ever recover your view about these kind of policy areas and, and then we'll come, we'll start to wrap up the session. Well, I think that's, uh, it's been a tough time for people making decisions, okay? Uh, this is like uh, playing this, uh, this card game where you have to get to 21 points. If you do, if you stop too short, you're blamed. If you make too much, you're blamed as well. Okay, so- The we game's called to... the blackjack. 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 Oh, blackjack, okay. We call seven and a half in Spain. In the <laughs> playing cards, okay? So uh, in this case, uh, when you 
the same thing happens here. If you start uh, reacting too early, you are going to be blamed for that. And probably health will not suffer, but the economy will suffer more. If you take too long, it will be the economy suffering a lot. And sorry, the, the health will suffer more. Maybe the economy will not. If you take far too long, both of them are going to suffer. So I don't. I would not like to be in the position of the people having to make these decisions in the in the different governments. Okay, the problem here, I think, is that in some of the governments, uh, they have not had done the stress test before either. They have not played the role. Say, what would, would the government do? What should we do? And most of the experts that have been uh, having to deal with this uh, situation, they have centralized decision making but they have not the experience of managing under the normal conditions. And I think they have uh, sometimes uh, making decisions with not the right information. And so John, we're kind of to, to close, to start to close our, our session, we got a few minutes left. From a supply chain point of view, you know, given where we are today, and again, we'll have, uh, we have people, we have a thousand people on uh, watching the, the live broadcast and, and, and more people will watch it afterwards. So maybe if you could talk a little bit about uh, for, for companies in Europe, for companies in North America and companies in Asia and perhaps even Africa and, and, and other parts of the world, you know, what, what should people pay be attention to? Where should their heads be at and how should they be behaving? Well, uh, it, it's difficult. I think it's um, in situations like this one, it's, it's useful to have a framework that you can uh, go back to and at least it guides you in making sure that you are not forgetting something important. That's actually what I, I try to cover in this presentation, give you a basic framework, which is a simple one on crisis management, say uh, we may be late now for prevention and detection, but it's the time to prevent and detect for the future. So let's go back make sure that we have everything that we need in place in these five steps. Of course, in each one of them, you can get into much more detail in your processes. We can look at how do we get supplies? How do we manufacture? How do we deliver? How do we return? How do we recover part of what we want? We may want to get into a more circular economy using the, ex the excuse of the coronavirus, if you want to call it like that. How do we plan for that? How do we make sure that we are continuously questioning whether we are doing, even if it works, is the best we can do, and whether it will work or not with some stress in the system. And what Jay, Jama, are, on, you know, on, on this issue of the best we can do, there's a very specific question which just popped in from, from Jose Ramon, uh, because many people are not paying the next one up in the supply chain because they don't have, they're not selling anything, so they can't pay for anything. Is that ethical to, to kind of sell and send the bill further upstream? Well, uh, I don't know if it's ethical, but sometimes it's the only option you have. If uh, if you don't sell, what are you going to do? If you go bankrupt, sometimes uh, I think the situation here is between bad and worse. Okay, so either if I stop paying now and I survive, or I I pay and I go bankrupt, and this is actually the main discussion that we are having at the national level and also at the European level. How can we allow, how can we help companies to survive this so that they are able to make the uh, economy recover? If we force everybody to pay, to pay the taxes, to pay the suppliers, to pay everything, and that makes companies go bankrupt, we'll have a company without debt, but there will be no country left. So and this gets back to the thing them. about having uh, friends, because if you've been a steady customer for many, many years, and you say to your supplier after many, many years, listen, you know, I need you now. It might, it's different than saying uh, after having not to have the relationship, what they call in China, the guanxi, the connectedness is Absolutely. more difficult to build it on the fly. Is that correct? Absolutely. You need to, you need to dig your well before you are thirsty. And so you need to have prepared this network of people that uh, you can trust on and they can trust on you in the same way that you demand, you demand your suppliers. Maybe your suppliers will demand you to do something for them so that, so that they don't go bankrupt. In, in preparing for the future, we need to make sure that we have the network of suppliers that we need and we, need, we have the talent inside the company that we need. So we cannot get rid of everybody just for the sake that uh, we want to eliminate that. We need to keep this if we want to recover eventually. Chama Ribeiro, thank you so much for, for, for spending your time with, uh, with all of our 
uh, alumni and our friends uh, this afternoon. I think your, your ideas of uh, understanding where you are in these five steps and then taking the steps you need to take is, is, is what people need to hear. Uh, remember this session is, uh, will be available on LinkedIn uh, for viewing after the broadcast. Uh, you can also, uh, we also encourage you to visit ESA's website, www.esa.edu. There's a, a resources page, an open access resource page. We can see all the different things we've been doing and talking about this, uh, this emergency situation. And remember that this week we have two additional um, uh, live webinars. So the next one is tomorrow, same time, 4 p.m. in Central Europe, which is 10 a.m. in New York City and 10 p.m. in Shanghai. We'll have Professor Nuno Fernandez. He's a finance professor who has just published, uh, I think, a quite a quite an impactful study on his estimates of the economic impact that this thing will have. So thanks for tuning in uh, on the live broadcast, and I hope uh, you, you can stay safe, do what you have to do to protect your people, and do what you have to do to protect the company. So thanks very much, and have a, have a great afternoon, evening, or morning, and, and, and do what you have to do. Thank you, and goodbye.